What would you do if somebody in power, a, a person with authority, told you to hurt somebody? Would you do it or would you say, no, I'm not doing that? Today we're talking about an experiment that set out to solve that exact question, the Milgram obedience experiment. It is the probably the most famous psychological experiment if not it's definitely one of them and it's lived rent free in my head for probably 12 years now so stanley milgram is a man he was born in 1953 he was born to parents adele and samuel milgram now adele his mother immigrated to the u.s from romania and samuel immigrated to the u.s from hungary now stanley and myself we got a couple things in common for one we are the middle child of three now we've got a couple things that aren't in common as well he is jewish and I am not. Now, being a Jewish man in 1953, he and his immediate and extended family were all pretty well affected by the Holocaust. He had family members staying at his place in the Bronx that were affected by the Holocaust. He, they had the little tattoos and it, it kind of was etched into his head in a way. He was even quoted in a letter that he wrote to a friend saying, I should have been born into the German speaking Jewish community of Prague in 1922 and died in a gas chamber some 20 years later. How I came to be born in the Bronx hospital I'll never quite understand. With the Holocaust weighing so heavily on his mind, he would later do a, a psychology experiment that was pretty well inspired by the Holocaust. Now Milgram, he had, a, he had a full life. There's a lot of stuff to him besides this experiment, although it is the main thing that he's become known for. It's also the most controversial thing I'm pretty sure that he's become known for. Now, three months before Milgram began his experiment, the uh, trial of Adolf Eichmann actually started. Now he was one of Hitler's top guys. He played a pretty big part in the Holocaust and his trial was televised. It's important to note that the that just following orders was kind of a mantra of the Nazis during the Nuremberg trials. It actually is colloquially called the Nuremberg defense for that reason. In the experiment itself, Milgram had said, could it be that Eichmann and his million accomplices in the Holocaust were just following orders? Could we call them accomplices? It's pretty undeniably like a reason for this experiment. Now, it's important to note too that one of the many issues that people had with this experiment was its applicability to the Holocaust. And we'll get into that a little bit later and talk about the reasons why. Some of them are pretty apparent, to be honest. Now, I'm still a little bit sick. I've been recovering for three weeks now. It is what it is. My voice is still a little trashed. You're just gonna have to deal with it. My apologies. Now, in this experiment, there's three people. The learner, the teacher, and the experimenter. Now the experimenter wears a lab coat and tells the teacher what to do. The learner is strapped into an electric chair and the teacher teaches word pairs to the learner. Every time the learner gets a word pair wrong, the teacher has to administer an electric shock and each time it's 15 volts stronger. The first electric shock is 15 volts and the last electric shock is 450 volts. And at the end of the experiment, he has to administer this shock three times. So it, it's, it's no joke. Also the shock generator on the 15 volts, it's labeled slight shock. And then at 450, it's labeled danger severe shock. So it, it's pretty well obvious and it's gonna hurt the guy. Now there is a pretty major twist on this experiment. The learner's in on it. So the experimenter and the learner are actually both in on the test and the teacher is the subject. Now the Milgram obedience experiment had a bunch of variations, but in the first iteration, there were 40 participants. Now the teacher is told that this is a experiment of memory and learning, and it's not. It's an experiment of obedience, as you and I both know. So basically the teacher and the learner, they both arrive to the, to the Yale University campus, wherever it is that this experiment's being held. They both draw a slip of paper. Each slip of paper says teacher on it, and this is to give the illusion that the teacher draws teacher. The learner is always going to say learner. So the only person that really needs to actually read the paper is the teacher. Now, the teacher is given a sample shock. It probably feels like a tens unit. It was described as like a light tickling feeling uh, just to kind of give him an idea of, hey, you know, this is what it feels like. Teacher and learner are separated into separate rooms. Now they can communicate but they cannot see one another. The teacher teaches the word pairs to the learner. Learner presses a button to answer the question. And then again, if they're wrong, they get shocked. Now the learner is answering questions wrong on purpose to elicit a shock. There is no actual shock. 
the learner has a tape recorder that has a shock sound on it and they act like they're being shocked. Sometimes they'll say, oh, ay, ay. sometimes they'll say, oh, please stop, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes they'll hit the wall and sometimes they'll stomp their little feet or whatever it is they got to do. There are uh, predetermined scripted responses at each level to keep it going, you know, the scientific method and all that. At the highest voltages, the learner is completely silent. Now there's two ways for this experiment to end, okay? The first way is for the person to refuse to shock somebody. Now in this scenario, the teacher refuses to shock. Now the experimenter has something to say about it. There are four possible responses. They have to be exactly this and they have to be said in this order. Person refuses to shock, experimenter says, please continue or please go on. If the person still refuses to shock, the experimenter says, the experiment requires that you continue. If the teacher still refuses to shock, the experimenter says, it is absolutely essential that you continue. Again, if the person still refuses to shock, the experimenter says, you have no other choice, you must go on. And if the teacher still refuses to shock, the experiment ends. The other way is to go through every possible voltage and then at 450 to administer that shock three times. If either one of those things happens, the, uh, the experiment ends. Now I have to mention that these prods, the things that the experimenter says to convince the teacher to continue, they have to be word for word what I told you. They also have to be in that order and they can only move on to the next prod when the teacher still refuses to shock after being told one. Now the results of this experiment were shocking. <laughs> Uh, to say the least. Every single participant administered the 300 volt shock and 65% administered the 450 volt maximum shock uh, three times. A, a little bit alarming, honestly. This is the ad for the Milgram obedience experiment, at least the first one. We'll pay you $4 for one hour of your time persons needed for a study of memory. We will pay 500 New Haven men to help us complete a scientific study of memory and learning. The study is done at Yale University. Each person who participates will be paid $4 plus 50 cents car fare for approximately one hour's time. We need you for only one hour. There are no further obligations. You may choose the time you would like to come, evenings, weekdays, or weekends. They wanted these types of people. Factory workers, city employees, laborers, barbers, businessmen, clerks, professional people, telephone workers, construction workers, salespeople, white collar workers, and others. Meaning basically anybody, as long as they're men. All persons must be between the ages of 20 and 50. High school and college students cannot be used. You will be notified later of the specific time and place of study this none of that matters it's important to note that they were told that they'd be paid the four dollars regardless of whether they complete the experiment so that had little to do with the results it was a point of contention later i remember reading a while back that there was a variation on the obedience experiment in which nobody was paid and that was the only change now i can't find that information anymore i feel like they didn't really make much of a difference but i really can't find the source on that now i did find a video from plainly difficult which said this even more strange was the results were similar when a control study was undertaken with 43 unpaid students. Which is evidence to what I'm saying, but his sources also, the link is broken. So I really, I really can't find where this came from. It probably came from the book Obedience to Authority by Stanley Milgram. I checked it out a long time ago. I read the whole thing a couple of times, but I don't have access to it now. So I, I can't confirm, but if that's, if you have a library card, maybe you check it out. The reception of this experiment was pretty widespread. Now that being said, uh, the ethical parts of it are probably not so good. The subjects didn't realize that they were the only subjects. They thought the test was about something else. They didn't know that they weren't actually harming the other person. And a lot of people showed pretty obvious signs of stress and like severe anxiety about shocking the person. Now besides the deception and besides the uh, anxiety, there is a phenomenon called inflicted insight in which a person is shown a side of themselves that they didn't know about and now they have to live with the knowledge that that's how they are.
And in this situation, obviously, it's they have to live with the knowledge that they would absolutely harm somebody just because a dude in a lab coat told them to. It's wild. And there's also some questions of validity. You know, it's hard to say how many people knew it was an act and then continued just because they thought it'd be funny. Although I will say that it's pretty obvious based on people's reactions that a lot of them thought it was true. Stanley Milgram wasn't the only one who did these experiments, uh, as is with a lot of famous experiments. People tend to redo them themselves. Hey, Latif, I'm Chris Hansen with NBC. You looked a little upset. I thought maybe we should interrupt here. For Hi. You okay? Yeah. yeah. Were you getting a little upset? Yeah, my heart's beating really fast. All right, well, calm down. Now, why did you continue to shock him? I didn't know what was going to happen to me if I stopped. And from what I understand, and I'm not, a, I'm not a PhD in psychology or anything, but from what I understand, the results were pretty well uh, similar across the board. So like I said earlier, there were some uh, issues of the applicability to the Holocaust. Uh, it was said that this was done to see, hey, maybe uh, the people in the Holocaust were just following orders. Maybe there's some val validity to that argument or whatever. The argument was it doesn't apply well. James Waller was was a pretty outspoken person in these points. He said that the subjects of the experiments were assured in advance that no permanent physical damage would be done, but in the Holocaust, the, the people were fully aware that they were causing grave injury to people. The lab subjects weren't motivated by hatred or racism or any other prejudice, whereas the Holocaust perpetrators clearly were. He said that the people in the lab weren't hate mongers and sadists, but the people perpetrating the Holocaust had a end goal literally called the final solution and uh, while the experiment milgram's experiment lasted for an hour the holocaust uh lasted for years and whereas in an hour you might not really have time to fully process exactly what you're doing to somebody years is plenty of time to turn around and say, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. And then of course, Thomas Blass said, my own view is that Milgram's approach does not provide a fully adequate explanation of the Holocaust. He goes on to say some more stuff, but I'm gonna go on a limb and say, that that was probably not the goal here. I don't think Stanley Milgram was trying to say, hey, the Nazis weren't so bad after all. Look, you know, people obey authority and, and that's, you know, who you can't really blame them. In fact, his own uh, hypothesis was that not many people would go through with shocking them and that maybe there was something specific in German culture that made them more able to, to hurt somebody than in American culture. And then it was kind of an upset, the results were. So I don't think that was necessarily uh, his goal. But I want to point out a couple of even more obvious reasons why it wouldn't be fully applicable. There was no inherent or implied threat to the subject's lives or families. If they didn't comply, they weren't at risk of being shipped off to camps themselves. Like the people perpetrating the experiment weren't filled with hate. You know, there wasn't a whole manifesto put out by Stanley Milgram about the learners and, and why everything they did was the reason for the downturn of society ahead of time. There wasn't a military backing him. He wasn't a person in power. It was literally a person in a lab coat telling people what to do. It applies on almost no level, but it is still really interesting because at its base level, it is would the normal everyday person hurt somebody even just a little bit just because someone told him to. And me, myself, I've always had an issue with authority. It's why I didn't join the military. It's why it's actually something that I've struggled with for most of my life, because even if I'm planning on doing something, if someone then tells me to do said thing, I don't want to. Uh, it, it, it's a problem for me. So this whole thing for me is fascinating because it turns out most people actually do. I feel like a lot of people, including maybe myself, would say, yeah, I would never do that. I'm not going to shock a guy just because I was told to, especially when it's obvious he's hurting. But uh, these results kind of say maybe a little introspection is needed. But, but the variations are really cool. The results of these variations is crazy. There's a variation where uh, Stanley Milgram switched up the uniform. Uh, in the original experiment, the experimenter was wearing a lab coat to give a uh, air of authority. And in the variation, there is no lab coat. And literally the compliance rate, the amount of people that went through with the full 450 volts three times fell to 20% from 65%. 
crazy drop. They're from a lab coat, crazy. Also, the location apparently plays a big part. The original experiment was done at Yale University. You may have heard of it. It's kind of at a, an important place. It's got a lot of prestige and all that bullshit. They did another one in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut, I think it is. I don't, I don't know. It's this, this state, kind of a less prestigious area. The compliance rate fell from 65% to 47.5%. So that's a wild drop as well. There's also a variation. It's called the two-teacher variation, a two-teacher approach. The main teacher, the actual uh, subject of the experiment, doesn't have to shock the person themselves. They can direct someone else to, and the somebody else is in on it. So the person being experimented on tells somebody else, hey, okay, shock him. When that happened, unsurprisingly, the compliance rate went up from 65% to 92.5%, meaning the vast, vast majority of these subjects, while maybe wouldn't be okay with pushing the button themselves to shock somebody, was more than okay to tell someone else to do it, which is crazy. There is the touch proximity variation in which the teacher has to physically force the learner's hand onto a shock plate. Uh, also unsurprisingly, the uh, compliance rate fell pretty hard on this one down to 30%. Somehow still higher than just switching a lab code out, but hey, it is what it is. There's the absent experimenter variation in which the experimenter uses the phone to direct the learner to shock somebody. And in this one, it, the compliance rate fell to 20 and a half percent. Experimenter's not in the room. I don't have to do what you're telling me to do, man. I don't even know who you are. Never seen you before. Then there's a proximity variation in which the learner and the teacher are in the same room. Uh, and so the, the, they're closer, right? So the teacher has to watch the learner's reaction. Uh, compliance rate fell down to 40%. Again, somehow still higher than just switching out a lab coat. I can't believe how effective a lab coat is in this situation. Then there's a variation where the experimenter gets a call on the phone, answers it, moves to another room, and then a second teacher who's actually uh, in on the joke here comes in and then instructs the person to shock. And in that case, compliance again falls to 20%. For me, the most inspirational variation of all of these is the social support variation in which two teachers, both being in on the experiment, refuse to, to shock the guy before the, uh, the teacher, the subject of the experiment is told to. In this situation, compliance fell all the way to 10%. So. If you are truly somebody who is pretty resistant to authority, if you are somebody who, you know, you feel you are strong in your ethics and in your values, and you know you're not going to hurt somebody, even if somebody tells you to, and maybe there's implications on yourself for that, this data at least suggests that if you first don't comply with somebody's harmful orders, that maybe the next person doesn't as well. So keep that in mind. I do want to mention also that there's a variation of this experiment done by Charles Sheridan and Richard King in which they used puppies, uh, fluffy little puppies instead of uh, people because they thought, well, maybe the acting gave it away and the results were pretty much the same. You know, take it for what it is. I just think it's really interesting. There's also some allegations from uh, a person named Gina Perry. In the Wikipedia article about Stanley Milgram and the obedience experiment, Gina Perry comes across as kind of a, as a naysayer, if you will. She's quoted as saying that there's a troubling mismatch between published descriptions of the experiment and evidence of what actually transpired, and that she wrote that only half of the people who undertook the experiment fully believed it was real and of those 66 percent disobeyed the experimenter at the very least this first quote here is framed irresponsibly in my opinion this is lifted from gina perry's article deception and illusion and milgram's accounts of the obedience experiments from july 2013 in which yeah she is talking about deception from milgram but mostly pertaining to the debriefing process so she's alleging that the debrief wasn't as thorough as it should have been and it didn't leave people as okay with what they had done as it should have. The second quote, I'm pretty sure this is from her book, Behind the Shock Machine, The Untold Story of the Notorious Milgram Psychology Experiments, and I haven't read that, so take it for what it is. However, there is an interview with her on NPR.org called Taking a Closer Look at Milgram's Shocking Obedience Study. She says a couple of things that again seem like pretty irresponsible quotes. Over 700 people took part in the experiments when the news of the experiment was first reported and the shocking statistic that 65% of people 
which the maximum voltage of the shock machine was reported, very few people, I think, realized then and even realize today that this statistic applied to 26 of 40 people, which admittedly is a very small sample size and I agree with her wholeheartedly. It never is put this way and it's to frame it in a certain way, a shocking way. But then she goes to say, of those other 700 odd people, obedience rates varied enormously. In fact, there were variations of the experiment where no one obeyed. While yes, that is true, the entire point of these variations was to see what causes people to obey differently. But the situations in which the experimenter takes off the lab coat, or the situation in which the experimenter leaves the or room, or the situation in which they're no longer doing the experiment at Yale, but instead they're doing it in Bridgeport, these are done on purpose, to purposefully see if that percentage falls, you know what I mean? Oh my goodness, in most of the experiments, it's a higher percent of people that actually disobey. Yeah, that's the idea. If you're trying to manipulate the results, you don't do those kinds of variations. Thank you so much for watching my video. There's a million videos on YouTube. There's probably a bunch over this exact subject. So the fact that you've stuck with me this long, the fact that you're still here, it means so much to me. Uh, you know, I just really appreciate it. So thank you and have a great day.